Joining us on this week's episode is our buddy Chris Hi. and Luke. You know, they helped us with uh, several of the filmings that we've happened, uh, that, that we've already done, and they're really into wines. And I could see the look of curiosity on their faces as we were filming and shooting. And I know they wanted to ask a bunch of questions. We tasted a bunch of wines over the X amount of episodes. So here They've they are this week. Since the reshoot of the first episode. Yeah. <laughs> The yeah. glow up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just to let you know, their expertise is filming and social media and what else? Uh, I guess talking mostly, story. Yeah, talk yeah. story. I guess meeting people. Yeah. Telling people, helping people tell their stories. Like you guys have a story to tell, so we're here to help you tell your story. Okay. So Chris, I what do you got to say? I mean, it's the same thing. Like the the general term that everyone's starting to use now is like we're content creators. So mm -hmm. it's not just videos. It's more than that. And that's kind of like, I guess, yeah, that's more of like a blanket statement to that. It's like, okay, you have something and like, okay, we're creating the content for that so that people like pretty much we help create it, package it and distribute. Mm -hmm. Like Luke okay. said, tell the story. Well, and for us, I think it was very important to have you guys on for one that, you know, we're all a team here from the very first episode and, and we want to be able to uh, portray that, you know, to you guys as well as anyone viewing this, as well as if <clears throat> we're talking about demystifying the world of wine, you know, I think we can all agree that it's great to listen to people like other sommeliers talk about wine, but <clears throat> as far as the average listener goes, sometimes maybe it's a little bit too over their head to where it's, you know, like all three of us are kind of learning together. So we will invite other people that are just beginning to learn to learn with us as we learn, which I think is very important. Yeah, I think it's very important. The kind of questions you guys were asking me when we were reshooting that first episode was pretty cool and pretty insightful. And, you know, there's no wrong <clears throat> or rights uh, w with wines. You know, it's just, you know, the kind of questions you're asking, I'm sure some of the viewers out there have similar questions. So yeah. whatever you ask is, is just pr helping us to provide information and help tell the story better, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I think, what kind of wines do you guys normally drink when you drink wine? Is it more New World? Is it more Californian or more Old um, World? I guess I, right now, I like more Old World. I'm really into Italian wines. Um, and I guess from learning from you, <laughs> I'm kind of more leaning more towards that, like learning more about where it's from, where it's made, uh, make sure there's no additives you know stuff like that yeah, stuff that's just like generally made okay that's kind of what i look for now but in the past it was more like commercial I'll, brands yeah i only yeah. like cabernet mm. right like i don't like merlot i don't right. like <laughs> this and then i met my wife and she kind of introduced me to like oh yeah no sulfates okay no sulfates <laughs> organic only okay organic only you know <laughs> but then you, you you taste the difference you know you you taste something from you know from a big box store compared to like a nice shop, it's a huge difference. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Chris, what about for you? Oh man, it is embarrassing. I kind of- No, nothing's I, yeah. embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> My experience with wine is kind of at a zero. I kind of just like, I guess That's more good. dessert wine. So okay. it's like- Slightly it's, sweet? Yeah. Like, cause I never, I guess my palate wasn't developed enough to really understand like how to go hand in hand until like we did like the first few episodes where you're like, okay, and then I'll try it with this. And I'm mm -hmm. like, holy shit, this is like, this is totally a game chamber. Uh, but yeah, so with that said, it's, I guess it's more of, I, I guess, yeah, new world. Cause I, I totally kind of what we talked <laughs> about. still in early in, yeah. yeah. It was just like, I, I was the sucker for labels. So anything that looked old, I'm like, I already knew cause I guess I've tried a handful of wines before, like actually before, or I used to go to this place called a uh, Swam. Swam, yeah, 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 yeah. Pearl City, yeah. Yeah, so she actually like. That's Jill. Exactly. I yeah, love yeah. Jill. So I used to go there every week because they would do like wine tasting, and she kind of like got me into it a little bit. Uh, fortunately, they had to close. This is like years ago, but she was the one that actually kind of got me into it. Did you ever go to J and J? No, I haven't. That's over there in Iea Park. That's a wine shop too. Yeah. So Nathan, who owns that shop, he would, uh, we used to work together at Kahala Hilton for many years, and he does wine tastings every week. You should check him out. It's J&J. &J, <coughs> it's up there on the upper road. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, on the upper road, when you're going in the back of IA and whatnot, and, yes. you, and you're going like the bowling at that bowling alley is up uh, yeah, there, bowling. you know, oh, I, you know all that stuff. Yeah. Okay. So one of the wines that we tried on that uh, reshoot of the first episode was a dry rosé from Portugal. Do you guys remember that? 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, man, I've been yeah. hunting for that the forever. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. That, That's why we're not featuring because it's not <laughs> readily available. Okay. Okay, so how was that different for you? Have, have you ever experienced very many dry rosés before? We'll start with you, Luke. I have not. I have not. My experience with rosé was it's always kind of a joke to order. Or like or yeah, kind of yeah. feminine girl, kind of yeah. feminine, yeah. I mean, I used to work at a bar myself in Kirkland, Washington. Oh, I was a bar back, and then I was a restaurant bartender, and wow. we only had like one row of rosé. It was always the last row in the well, you know, <laughs> and like it was always be like one every three weeks. Someone would order it, and we would all get a chuckle, <laughs> you know, because a like, chuckle, oh. yeah, a good laugh, because like oh. we pour, it's like I don't know how this bottle is, I don't know, you know, because we never have to restock it. So that was my experience with Rosé. And how, then how about for you, Chris? I mean, it, it's not that hands-on, but yeah, I always saw it as like more of like a feminine drink. And I guess through mm-hmm. like hip-hop culture, like it just was... No bueno. Yeah, I mean, I drank it, but I didn't, I didn't know what I was looking for. And for me, again, like I kind of liked the lighter. Like I, I liked it, but I was afraid to be caught in public drinking it almost. <laughs> and, and, uh, and okay, having said that, that's where you guys came from. So how was your experience tasting that Portuguese version, the Vino Verde? <sighs> How would you describe that, Luke? I would describe it as like a, a lighter <clears throat> red wine, basically. And exactly. refreshing. And it, it still tasted like wine. It didn't taste like candy or like uh, bubbly. You know, it was, it tasted like wine. And if you were to close your eyes and drink it, you would think it's a glass of red. Yeah, but, good, good point. I yeah. agree with you. And how about for you, Chris? Um, I guess for me, it's like... I, it was eye opening. It's like, I, uh, oh man, I guess you could say it's like the entire, like my entire life I've been eating steak well done. And all of a sudden, mm, someone gave good. it to me like oh, that's a good medium one. rare. And yeah. I was like, oh my God, is this how it's supposed to taste yeah, like? That's so good. that's exactly how I felt. Well, and that's the thing is, there's a lot of shitty roses out right. there to, to siphon to, right? So to be introduced and, you know, like we're all saying, is eye opening. <clears throat> Something that's balanced, it's not too alcoholic, <laughs> it's not bitter. Okay, so uh, just to let you guys know, you know, not all pink wines are created equal, right? So all wines, whether it's Cabernet Sauvignon or whether it's sparkling or whether it's fortified or whether it's pink colored, all wines can be made dry, medium dry, medium, medium sweet, sweet dessert, depending on what the winemaker wants to do. Mm. So you can have sweet pink wines, you can have sweet Cabernet Sauvignon. Or you can have dry versions and all in between. I see. So that rosé that you had, uh, the, the rosés that you experienced before mm-hmm. were probably the slightly sweet kind of, you know, low alcohol, you know, fizzy, slightly fizzy things. Yeah. And that's one category of pink wines. But the, that Portuguese version that you had was a dry wine. Right. And it was dry and it was the very style of wine one would have at a cafe or a bistro along the countryside somewhere in Portugal. Specifically closer to the ocean, probably, because it, it was meant to go with cafe-style foods. So you guys understand that, that that's what that Portuguese vino verde was. Mm. And the reason why we're not, just so you listeners understand, the reason why we're not showing you the bottle and we're not, uh, it's not available. I mean, we, 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 Kelly and I went to all these wine stores wow. and we couldn't find another bottle of it. So I didn't want to show you something that's not readily available, right? Wow. So having said that now, let's segue, before we start talking more story, just to kind of relax, let's segue into a different rosé, okay? okay? That's what I poured in your glass. What do we have here? So this is a rosé that, that's made from 100% Malbec wow. from the area of Cahors. Cahors is in southwest France, just below Bordeaux. And these families down there, they have their own kind of lango, uh, ling, uh, lingo. It's, it's Basque country, so they have their own style of cooking. They have their own, you know, pigeon English kind, you know, French pigeon English-like, you know, their own, you know, colloquial, you know, kind of language. And, you know, they have their own, you see the signs and it's all, uh, you sit there going, what the hell does that mean, you know? So it's its own little niche in, in this whole world of France. Oh, wow. And so this comes from this, and it's kind of a little backwards. It's not city, you know, it's more country. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that's where this wine comes from. Malbec is the grape variety. As you know, Malbec is most famous from Argentina probably today. Right, right, yeah. But Malbec is actually, I mean, Cahors is actually considered the ancestral home of the Malbec grape variety. They've been making this for centuries. Ancestral home, meaning like that's where this grape originated from? Oh, there's controversy between there and Bordeaux, but, you know, it's that general area. Bordeaux is right above it, so... 
Malbec came from one of those those in between somewhere in believe they believe, you know whether that's true or not. I, I don't care, but I'm just the point is is that, you know There's Malbec has there. been there yeah. a long time, and these families have been doing it for a long time. You know they, they still call it Malbec even though it's not the Argentina. Or yes, what? so Argentina came later. You know. Oh, okay. So that's why you look at Argentina. They have 80 year old vines. Some people have maybe. You know, once in a while you see a hundred-year-old vine cuvee, but I mean, here in Cahors, it's like, Cahors. you know, long time, long. you know, way longer. So, um, I just wanted you to try okay. uh, a different rosé that's dry, but this one is more masculine. It's mm. more savory. It's not so light and carefree like that Portuguese vino verde that you had. I just wanted you to try a different style that's of rosé as conversation. And is it more masculine because it's made from Malbec? I'm going to try it. I think partly, yes. Malbec is a very thick-skinned grape, so it's very dark-colored. It's very pigmented. That means it has a lot of tannins. You look at the black grape at a grocery store, when you bite into the skin, it's yeah. bitter, right? So imagine having a thicker skin. It's going to have more bitterness typically, oh. right? So this is a very hearty, <clears throat> tannic uh, grape variety. It is. It's very hearty. Yes. Yeah. So you know what Luke was saying about the Vino Verde, where when he tried it, if he was closing his eyes, he would think that it was a red wine? This is even more so. Yeah. The same, yeah. This is even more like yeah, a red more wine. More than so, the, yeah, the, more so. So the best way I can describe to you guys is, uh, Chris, when, first of all, before I go into it, I, I don't want to give up too much information. What, give me your thoughts on the, on the wines. Um, I mean, yeah, not straying off from what you guys were saying. Like, I do feel it's a lot... There's a lot more body to this, a little more heavier. Yes, exactly. Um, I guess, I don't know, is that acidity or something? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what I'm feeling, like kind of my, my tongue's getting wrapped around. But it's like, it's not, it's not overwhelming where I'm like, oh, I want to stop. Like it keeps it, for me, it <clears> keeps my, it keeps my palate interested to like, okay, I kind of want to keep going. Especially, I guess, with the light carbonation that's going on where it kind of just rewipes it. Yeah, very good. So, you know, uh, Luke, you mentioned mm -hmm. that these rosés remind you kind of a red wine? Yeah. Okay, so my, my answer to that is that, or my thoughts on that, I shouldn't say answer, my thoughts on that is that, you know, I think everybody will agree there's been the warming of the planet, mm -hmm. right? So it's getting hotter and hotter more frequently, correct? Okay. Yeah. So what used to be the small, little, lighter red wines are now disappearing mm. because it's riper, bigger. So that's why... At our vino restaurant, we carry so many pink wines because there's all different levels of pink wines that are available. And we use them in cases like this as a substitute for those light, quaffable red wines that of you the can't old really days. Find anymore. Oh. Yeah. Mm. So that's where this comes. I just wanted to show you a step ladder up yeah. from the Portuguese version okay. to something with a little bit more oomph. And if you close your eyes, uh, something that you would think is a more like a red wine. Mm -hmm. Yes? Definitely. And, and so what is the name of this wine? So the, the domain is Clola Coutal. And um, Cahora, I believe, is a red wine appellation, but I'm not sure. But the, the, all you see is rose, uh, red wines. So this can't be labeled Cahora, I believe. That's why it's just called Malbec. Mm. But this is from their estate. If you look, it says <coughs> Misan Bute uh, uh, of the property. So it, it is estate bottled and, so, um, and estate grown, you know, and so... Um, so it is within the Cahor appellation. I just think that they, they made it differently from the laws or maybe rosé. I, I don't know if rosé is considered uh, approved by the government there to be called Cahor. I think Cahor is a red wine appellation, if my memory serves me correct. But, you know, I'm getting old, so who knows. But it's just Coutal uh, uh, Malbec Rosé. And, and how much would it. you pay for this at a store? Sixteen dollars. Oh. Wow. Sixteen dollars, really? Chris. Sixteen dollars. So, and and that's really a thing. I, I don't know if it's that's true amazing. or not, but from what I'm noticing, at least, like a lot of the rosé, it just seems that there are more rosés available for a better price range. Is that true? Um, it can be, you know, but that that's just a general statement. I don't think it's yeah. absolutely true in all cases. I just think so. Just to let you guys know. A little bit of a story behind these kind of wines. Generally speaking, uh, rosés were a byproduct of red wine production. 
So when you're making red wine, you leave the skins in there to give it more flavor, more oomph. You know, it's like, you know, crab, you leave the shells there because it gives it more flavor, right? Mm -hmm. The same thing, you leave the skins on there because that's really where the flavor is, more so than the juice. Mm. So they leave the skins on there for a long time. They harvest the grapes when they're really ripe and therefore the skins in the case of Malbec is very thick, right? And then they'll uh, leave it on there and, it, and in the rising alcohol levels will leach out the color and the bitterness that's found in the skins, okay? So that's why red wines are black and bitter. Somewhere along the line during the production, someone discovered, well, let's bleed off a little bit of the juice and thereby we're concentrating the juice to skin ratio more in the red wine production you understand mm -hmm. and so with that left with that bled off juice which is referred to as sanye then they try to make a different a decent pink wine with it because it ha will have some color depending on how long it's been in contact with the skin well the problem with that the grapes were harvested at high potential alcohol levels to make a big sturdy red wine so they're very ripe and you know Therefore, you're going to have high alcohol and bitterness in the corresponding pink wine in, in more cases. High alcohol and bitterness. Yes. So you can kind of compare it to, I guess, with whiskey, like a devil's cut? With yeah, whiskey. exactly. But this is what they do. Now, today, in the past 10, 15 years, they've discovered if you want a good rosé, you have to set out to make a good rosé. Not just the extra juice from making a exactly, red wine. Exactly, not like the leftovers. You go intentionally to make exactly. a rosé. So uh, you harvest at lower degree alcohol mm. in more marginal growing areas so that it takes longer to ripen, so you have physiological maturity, but you don't have the alcohol. And so the what is physiological maturity to explain that? Topic? Okay, so... Because that's something you talk about a lot. When you, harv when you grow a grape, you want it to have physiological maturity. Sugar ripeness is only one part of physiological maturity. And sugar ripeness happen, tends to happen first. So if you pick based upon high sugar levels, then maybe the acids and everything else did not get physiologically mature. So the idea that many people believe is by slowing down the sugar ripeness during the growing season, meager soils, cooler climates, wind pounding the vineyards, all these different factors that slows down the sugar ripeness, the grapes will hang on the vine longer and get more and more physiological maturity, mm. you know, by doing so. You, you got it? Mm. Okay, so in the case of this thing, they're harvesting it on, on, you know, more rocky places, wind pounded places, whatever, to slow down the sugar ripeness. Here, Chris, have some more. <laughs> and, you know, at the same time, they're treating it like a white wine where they're pressing it and getting rid of the skins. Okay. So it's not so colored, it's not so bitter. You got it? Mm -hmm. So that's why the, 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 the amount of good rosés that are available to you is increasing in availability because people understand if you want a good rosé, you have to set out to make it. Now here's the challenge with it all. The challenge with it all is that for these grapes that are used to make this thing, you can get two or three times the amount of dollars for the red version mm. than for the rosé version. You got it? So that's the, that's the issue. So, you know, instead of paying $23 for the red version or uh, uh, maybe $30 for the red version, then now you, you, you're paying 15 or 16 for the rosé version. So the winery is making less money for those grapes. You got it? But here's the thing that a lot of people are cashing in on. Not all of the vineyard is going to produce that, quality, yeah. red, sturdy wine, you know, trophy-style wines. Got it. So therefore, they know which parcels are not going to fully ripen to make bravado. So that's why they'll... they'll they can diversify. Yeah, they can diversify. And with these rosés, they're bottled and they're released right away and they're sold right away. So it also helps with the cash flow. Mm -hmm. The turnaround is faster. Exactly. I see. And so you can drink it right away. Exactly. Right? Where Malbec, you might have to age it a little bit more. Exactly. Do you think um, rosés rose aren't as popular? Or no, it's booming. It's going like booming. this. Oh, wow. It's booming in popularity. People <clears throat> understand 
you know, that, um, you know, with, with the way that everybody's traveling nowadays, during these months like August right now, where it's you, hot, you yeah. go down to the cafe or bistros along the Mediterranean basin, everybody's got crafts of pink wines there. It's, it's a way of life down there, and it has been for a long time. So they eat the food and they gulp the wines, and it's always pink down oh, there. Wow. So it, it's catching on. As, Especially with it, social media. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if we talk about labels being attractive, I think just the color of a rosé in a glass is like an aesthetically pleasing label in the sense of like it, it looks beautiful, you know? Yeah. Oh, so one, I have one question though. So, you know, when you ask Chris about what he thought about this wine, it's a drier rosé. He said that there's hints of acidity to it. What does a wine like this, what kind of purpose does it serve? at a table is it to cleanse your palate and get you ready for the next bite i think so that's number one i think that this could be an aperitif so it stimulates your saliva glands so you it's like sucking on a lemon you want to eat afterwards right mm -hmm. so this thing stimulates your appetite i think i think <clears throat> that's a really good thing here's the thing that i i keep saying about pairing rosés like this it's like again the thanksgiving feast you have the roast turkey, the stuffing, the fixings, all this rich, savory food. Then all of a sudden you have the cranberry. So when you eat the cranberry, it refreshes your palate so you can go back to eating all that rich, savory food. That's what rosés can do at the dinner table when, when you pair it well. So like at Vino, as you guys know, we have that, uh, that braised uh, Spanish octopus with the white bean and ham hock stew. So it's a very rich, savory dish. We created it for light red wines, but certainly you could do this rosé with it and it will refresh in your palate even mm -hmm. more oh. than being savory and unsavory. So I think that that's a really good function. And now the Portuguese rosé that you had, because it's lighter oh. and it's more uplifting. Then at Sanse, we have the truffled crab ramen, which is one of the signature dishes. It's crab ramen made with a little bit of truffle oil on top. Oh my gosh, oh. that thing is major league. And because that, that broth is kind of rich, then that uplifting style, this won't go with it, but that uplifting uh -huh. Portuguese rosé uh. that you guys had would be more apropos to those kind of foods, beef luau, uh, oxtail soup, you know, rich soups like that. Then that rosé, well chilled, will make sense. Awesome. You know, pig's feet, uh -huh. yeah, awesome. it makes sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I like that. It's crazy that every, like, you know, with wine, especially wine and food pairing, that there's multiple ways that you can go on it, it it'll change the experience you know like you said there's the cranberry like this wine is the more of a cranberry Amazing. effect where other wines have the uplifting effect it's really a, I, I can't believe that there's so many types of wines that you can find the right one for the food you're eating for for a grilled cheese sandwich you can find the right <laughs> wine for that absolutely and you know, you know like the other day Kali texted me uh -huh. and uh someone was making ribs yeah Okay, so one was a black pepper rub. Yeah, dry black pepper rub. Okay, and the other was? The other was like a sweeter, I think there was a little bit of guava in it, a little bit of honey. So it was going to be more of a sweeter baby back rib style. Yeah. So, you, okay. so you got okay. ribs. ribs. But two different styles. Two, yeah. Prepared two different, completely different ways. Peppery and sweet. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, and what did you discover? So <clears throat> with the sweet ribs, he recommended a... Uh, Riesling that was, was it 10 and a half degree? 9.5. 9.5 degree alcohol. So there was sweetness to it. So his whole idea, his whole theory is that you want your liquid sweeter than your food, correct? Right. Otherwise, so to, to and, and you know, I would never think that to pair a white wine with ribs, essentially. So, so that thought is that, again, uh, I, we might have talked this in previous podcasts, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, you eat, a, you drink a Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola tastes sweet. Right? If you eat a Snickers bars first, yeah. and then you drink the Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola tastes <laughs> dry and bitter. Yeah. So what I learned from that, That's the wild. beverage always yeah. has to be slightly sweeter okay. than what it is you're eating. Okay. So in the case of the ribs, because it has honey or molasses yeah. or something like that, you need something that has some sweetness to it and lower alcohol. Okay, now in, in comparison to that, he had the dry black pepper rub. Yeah. And with that, you recommended the Sage Canyon from uh, Nyers. So that is a red wine uh, that's made. It's a red wine blend that's made from these uh, grape varieties that are more 
Obscure? No, they're more, um, they're noted to come from southern Rhone Valley of France and southern France. And they're the main grave was Carignan? Carignan. That? So, <coughs> how, did, how did that pairing go with you, for you? Honestly, <coughs> that, that, re- that Sage Canyon was one of the nicest, I mean, that was, to me, more a little bit more of a trophy wine compared to the Reese thing in that sense. It was beautiful. Yeah, so Carignan, just to let you know, makes not so strong, not so vanguard wines. It can, but it's m- the, the Sage Canyon he's talking about is more about deliciousness, and it's rounder, and it's softer, and it's less confrontational mm-hmm. with foods. And that's what, it's, it's a homage. It's a homage to a famous winemaker down in southern France who makes these kind of wines. But that one wouldn't work with the sweet. Ribs? No, no. So Why what not? happens with sweetness, it makes bitterness, alcohol, and uh, oakiness taste super bitter and super alcoholic. It makes it exaggerate. It becomes glaring. Mm. So red wines have higher, typically have higher alcohol levels and oakiness and, you know, more glycerin in the palate and more tannins. Mm. The Riesling, on the other hand, was, as I said, was only 9.5 alcohol as opposed to 13.9. You know, so way oh. significantly less. So it's not going to be as glaring with the pairing. Um, so I guess I want to get inside of your head. So I guess with that dry rub, like, what are you? Th- so I guess that I have a better understanding and the listeners have a better understanding. So what's sticking out to you is like, okay, dry rub, <coughs> pepper, mm-hmm. and then like, because it's like, you know, the formulas are kind of going in your head. Like, so. what's his process to yeah, pair yeah. the wine with the food? It's like, yeah. I, I understand the sweet one, but then yeah. like, okay, dry pepper. I'm like, I where don't do you know start? where to go. Yeah, because yeah, I'm like, okay, there's nothing sweet. So yeah. I'm like, where, where do I shoot? So what are the branches to yeah. the food pairing that he's asking? Okay, so <clears throat> in that first episode, Luke uh, and Chris, w- when we were talking, I mentioned that if you take a piece of meat and you s- marinate in red wine overnight... What happens to the meat is it gets tenderized. Mm. So the tannins and the alcohol and everything inside the, uh, the wine breaks down the marbling and the proteins that you see in the meat. Right? Okay. That's why they say, for practical reasons, red wine with red meats. And the more marbling you see in that meat, like lamb and ribeye, okay. the more tannins and alcohol you need in the corresponding wine. And the leaner the meat is, like veal, pork, chicken the less tannins and alcohol you need a corresponding wine. Mm. Got it? Okay, so the tannins, cor- like... Breaks down. Break, 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 to break, help it down. break it down. Oh, yeah. Breaks, oh, down, the like yeah. breaks down the fat. Yeah, breaks down breaking it down yeah. in your mouth as you're washing yeah. it. Damn. Okay, okay. Okay, so having said that now, let's look at pork. Mm-hmm. Pork can be fatty, but it's not a, it's not a mojo meat like lamb or... or it's not bloody and, and, and dark sure. and, and mojo like... Sure. like, like Beef or, or lamb, right? Yeah, so okay. white meat, right? So it's a whiter meat. So you're going to have fattiness, but it's a lighter fattiness. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you don't need mojo. You don't need swag, so much swag in a corresponding wine. Something more finesse. Yes, something more uh, delicate. <clears throat> in addition to that, he said black pepper rub. I'm sure there was some spices or herbs inside that black pepper rub. It's a dry rub that you rub on. So um, that's why... Carignan and Syrah and Grenache have a slight peppery quality typically as part of their profile. Mm. And so by combining the three so that Sage Canyon is made essentially from Carignan with some Syrah, some Grenache, and some Mouvette, all three or four of those grape varieties can have peppery components. So that's why that wine made total sense. It made total sense that it was, um, and ribs are going to be kind of fatty, right? So then you still need a little bit of tannins, but it's more exuberant, more fruity, so it makes it just uplifting. That's why that Sage Canyon worked with that, in my opinion, with, with that, those ribs, oh. those so, savory ribs. So be, while I was asking you, I was also texting Chris and Ariana to see what they, Chris and Ar, Ar, were on previous episodes to see what their thoughts and opinions are. Or not. And more so I asked them like, hey, with this black pepper dry rub rib, would Syrah work? just because it has those peppery characteristics and chris was saying something to do with the alcohol content you got to be careful if is that yeah so again and so sage canyon less yeah so not all syrahs are made equal Mm -hmm. so to make a blanket statement like that is very 
difficult because which Syrah are you talking about? Some are made with high alcohol, some are not. Mm-hmm. So um, I just chose because we were at that store or we saw it at that store, that Sage Canyon, because I think it was 13.9 alcohol and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. And it was just more about juic- juiciness and accessibility mm-hmm. and at the same time uplifting mm-hmm. to that pork. You know, that's what, wow. that's what the pairing was. Mm-hmm. What did Ariana say was the pairing? Um, I don't really remember what she was yeah. saying, actually. So everybody's going to have different interpretation, and there's no one right answer to, to, to oh, it. Chris, sucking them up, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, like, right now, it's kind of changing in my mouth. Like, it kind of tastes a little more sour. So what's going on with that? Is it because it's getting flat? It's warming up. Warm. Oh. It's warming up. So now so you're really you saying... So you want to serve this more chilled, this kind of wine? For me, I would prefer it more chilled. More yes. Chilled. But as you can see, as it warms up, it changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. like now I'm just like, oh, it kind of like woke me up, but in like almost a bad way. So is this why you would keep this like on an ice bucket? Absolutely. That's me. Now, interestingly, Chris, yeah, your palate's I'm, I'm, pretty I'm, good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Hey, Filipinos got good palate. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> a chef, it's the Chinese home. side. That's <laughs> a, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, so let me say this. So now as this thing warms up, you can notice the alcohol more level more, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is another thing that could potentially serve with that black pepper mm. uh, pork Rib. ribs that he was talking about. Oh. More of that cranberry effect. Yeah. So you have the, sp- the, the, the spiciness of the black pepper, the pungency. Yeah. This could refresh in your palate between bites because the alcohol is now higher. If I it mean, was just, served at this temperature yes. you're talking about? So depending on the pairing, it will determine what temperature you will serve the wine at. Absolutely. And you factor all that in? Yes. Wow. So you know the difference of a wine. Like, so say you're doing a pairing, you would know at what temperature to pair that wine with. Well, I can't say 100%, but I mean, I consider that. I consider that when I'm doing pairings. Mm. So that's why in some cases that it's marginally a red wine pairing, I'll chill down the red wine more. Well, make it a little cooler. What do you mean? Like it might not go with the it red It could wine? either go with, it's, it's on that border where maybe it's white wine, maybe it's super light red, uh, so I'll chill it down more. Or then also this is where maybe wine on the rocks comes into effect. Absolutely. Oh, that, that's another example. That's awesome. I tried it. Like, and and, and, and you good. know, it's good, it's, huh? It's so good. I think this I wine it. would taste good on the rocks too. So. Yeah. But you All cannot wines. let it sit on the ice too long, though, where it, yeah. it gets watered down. This wine cannot handle yeah. too much watering mm-hmm. down. But the other factor is that uh, Mark Shishido said that's going to be yeah. posted next week, the, uh, the wine director of Alan Wong's. Another thing to consider, bigger bite, smaller sip. Bigger bite, smaller sip. When bigger pairing sip, wine and smaller, food. Yeah. Big, you know, that could also affect. Okay. Bigger sip, smaller bite bigger in reverse. Okay. So that can also affect your pairing. Yeah. So if you know what I'm saying, it's yeah. it's not only temperature, but it's also whether you take a smaller bite or a bigger sip. What a food. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't kind of see that because it's just like, I don't know. I'm like a very visual person. It's like okay, it's like you're going. It's like if you take a bigger sip, it's like going somewhere and like with a what is it like a pressure wash and just washing everything away, right? <laughs> yeah. And then now it's just like kind of bare naked. And it's like okay, nothing I have to go against. So it's like too i guess too fresh or too new and then you kind of just i guess get overwhelmed by all the flavors going Mm on is that true yeah i mean everybody has reaction uh different ways you know i mean there's no one set answer Mm -hmm. i think this is all interesting dialogue they've provided (laughs) insight that uh and have asked questions that i think that all of you the viewers could get something out of because they are searching, you know, and, and there's no one answer to it all. They're just getting one perspective from an old man <laughs> so of some possibilities. Yeah. This Experience. is the next uh, yeah. generation of Chuck Furia boys then. Right on. <laughs> Dude, no, seriously, like ever since like the first two episodes, like every time I like think for lunch now, I'm like, okay, what is like, so my normal go-to drink at Starbucks is, uh, it's, it's uh, ice black tea with peach. And then like just slightly sweetened, so maybe like two teaspoons of like <laughs> cream sugar. And then now I'm always thinking, I'm like, okay, what, what, like, 
what can I pair with it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's crazy, yeah. But did you hear that episode where uh, I was talking about musubis? Yeah. That was the first episode, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Right? Oh, was it? Yeah. They were there. So yeah. that's the whole thing. Voice. Yeah. Passion. You know, what, yeah, Passion Orange yeah. and the other one I did the Ito and Green Tea. You know what I mean? With, uh, was it Green Tea with? Uh, the Green Tea was with the... Uh, Teriyaki. No, no, with the salami. Oh, yeah. Salami and the Portuguese sausage. More yeah. fatty uh, things, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that funny? It's like, yeah, something hey, there. can or no yeah. can? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Can? <laughs> so I have another wine from the same area, but it made red. But it's made, it's vinified to be red wine. Red wine, okay. But it's behind the curtain. So should I just reach back there and grab it? Yeah. Okay, hold on. You guys talk story. Okay. <clears throat> what is a good wine with lechon? Oh! oh we'll wait for him to come back. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> lechon. <laughs> well, what part of the lechon? <laughs> the, the face. The face. <laughs> rosé, bro. Oh. Like the Portuguese one. Rosé. Lighter rosé, yeah. Ah. Man, first, seriously, since that that Portuguese rosé, I felt like a crack addict, like going every place. I'm like, you guys, you guys have this, like, <laughs> <laughs> give me my Portuguese rosé, man. Yeah, because it's like, because I'm trying to like, I, I'm trying to explain it to people, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't find the bottle, but like, this just was so like, I don't know, for me, like, <clears throat> and it's and it was, it's reasonable. Yeah. So after that first episode, did it really sent you down a rabbit hole of finding wines. No, yeah, seriously, like it's. It's been like a drug for me now. Like I have all the references and that's why I'm like, uh, so what I was saying earlier before we started recording, it's like, uh, I live in like the west side of Hawaii and um, there's <coughs> not many places around that area that have do a, a great or vast. Ni um, super right there. Oh, for the wine selection? <laughs> 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 but yeah, so like that's kind of how I felt. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just knees, like. bro, knees. There's I, how maybe I try to buy like two or three bottles at a time now, and it's like so you stock up a little bit, huh? Yeah, but it's just like I don't know. I guess to me it's like they almost not like it's garbage, but I don't know what I'm buying. So I guess in like that case where it's just like some place that isn't so. So maybe we can actually relate this to you know we were talking, Dad, you and I about. Um, you know, for people that will listen to this that don't live in Hawaii, you know, we keep trying to tell people where to find these wines in our community. <coughs> but if Chris being out on the west side can't find it really available, what would you tell someone like that that's from the mainland or, you know, from somewhere else listening to our podcast, how to find wines like this? Or I guess like, yeah, so sorry, I'm going to like step on that yeah. a little bit. So let's be a little more specific. And let's say for that Portuguese rosé before we hop into this red, like what are some key opponents that I should be looking for to, I guess, somewhat match it so I could explain it to, you know, a friend or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, kind of tastes like this. Or, yeah, I, I don't know what, what I'm asking. Okay, you're asking uh, uh, many different... Two different yeah. questions. Yeah. Many yeah. questions here. Okay, so let's talk about Hawaii first and then we'll talk about the mainland second. Yeah. Okay, so... <clears throat> the, one of the ways to approach wines, for me, it's like... When I cook, I use every pot and pan that we have, man. It's a <laughs> mess. So my wife doesn't like when I cook a, lo a lot. Oh, I hate that too. Nice. No, but I wash when I go along. I, I don't let it sit. <laughs> I, I wash all the time. <laughs> don't take note of that. But then so at some point... I'm talking, about the, I'm talking about the pots and pans, Rob. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, That's so let me finish this. <laughs> Okay, so let me uh, say this. So um, it takes me X amount of days to go shopping to decide what I'm going to cook. So Cheryl and I <clears> go to all these farms and all these different places to find what we feel is fresh, whether it's manchong or whether it's, you know, swordfish. Those are the two fish we look for typically more than the mm. other fish. It has swordfish? a different texture. Yeah. Oh. How do you like to cook that? Seared. It's You got to... You the next time you come over, man, I'm telling you, manchong mm. and swordfish. I like manchong. No, but swordfish is really good. Anyway, I, think, I don't know. So when tomato, the, the, what happens then is then I decide what to cook, as opposed to deciding what I'm going to cook and then go shopping. Mm. Yeah. You got it. Mm -hmm. So then from there it becomes when tomatoes are in season, I go with tomatoes, and where they're not in season, I'm going to look for something else. Got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so having said that, I take that approach with wines. S certain wines are going to be available certain times of the year. Mm. Other wines are not. So I can't be set on buying that 
Vino Verde, which is green wine. It's translated to mean green wine and therefore meant to be consumed early and young. So it has the vitality. So if I have it 12 months later, it's lost some of that vitality. So I can't expect or wish that a store would carry those kind of wines all year round. Got it? Okay, then the second thing I want to say is that and this applies to the people on the mainland as well. All the big box stores, <clears throat> the main criteria of why they carry wines is based upon how many times it scans a week. So what that means is if X amount of bottles don't sell, it's out and a new brand comes in. It's based upon how many bottles sell. Okay. You think someone's going to come in and ask for a Vino Verde from Portugal or a Malbec Rosé from Southwest France? So... Those aren't the stores, if you want these kind of wines, that you're going to look, for, mm-hmm. you're going to look at. Right, right. And then from there becomes, whether you're on the mainland or here, you know, our daughter Melissa and, and, and Kali and now you guys, I think, you know, that kid out in Kailua has passion for wines. So you, by establishing a relationship with him, he hears what you're looking for, <coughs> and then he can steer you to a wine that's similar that happens to be in season then. Mm. So the secret to finding these kind of wines is to find a restaurant or a store that's into it. Don't expect to go to some market in in Pearl City where the people don't drink wine typically to find these kind of wines. It's not possible. There's not going to sell there. Mm -hmm. So the the store has to make money too. So I'm I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. It's just that's That's just the the way it is. That's the reality. So... <clears throat> so what Melissa and Fred do is they live on the North Shore and they plan that once every week or two weeks when they're running out of their stash, they go to Kailua to buy wines from that kid. And they plan on buying a case mm. so that it'll tide them over because it's an hour from Holly, uh, from Sunset Beach down to Kailua. So in, in relation to the mainland, it's finding a wine store or a restaurant that you have a re- you can form a relationship with, and that they're progressive on their wine selections. Not, mm. I'm not saying to catch that they carry the highest rated wines or yeah. the wines, the big verticals of Chateau Lafitte. No, those people that specialize in artisan, country style uh, foods, family is, owned, yeah, like yeah. that. Specifically from the Mediterranean, probably makes more sense. And you know, that's the kind of <clears throat> foods they're going to make, and that hopefully that's the kind of wines they're going to carry. And you'll know right away when you taste the wine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's no easy answer. The whole point is if you want this stuff, just like if you want a certain um, <clears throat> octopus dish, you got to go to a certain place, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We all have those favorites. So it's the same thing. You, you just got to find those places that specialize in these things, and then you, you establish a relationship with them so that they can say, hey, Chris, I just got this in. Hey, Luke, you know what's coming in two weeks? This thing. Mm-hmm. And now's a good time here in Hawaii because, you know, I, I, we, we went to the store in Kailua uh, uh, a few days ago, and I even bought some wines there because they had some wines that aren't normally or readily available on the retail sales. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's because a lot of the restaurants are either closed or they're doing less business that would carry these kind of wines so there's more available that g- can go around to other people besides who was originally bringing the wines in, you know? So there is some of these wines available today, like that rosé, uh-huh. mm-hmm. you know? So if there's any silver lining in this whole yeah. situation. You know what's interesting, though, <clears throat> is I went to a wine training class last week, Wednesday, and we had three a uh, flight of three glasses of white there's three different rounds. So the first round was all white, three glasses, all red, three glasses, and then all rosé, three glasses. <clears throat> and with the and for each wine or for each round, they wanted you to blindly taste and for one, answer the question of which one you like the most, <coughs> and then secondly, which one you think is the most expensive out of each of the three glasses of wine. Okay. And when we we're tasting the red, you know, I was going down and I tasted this red and I was like, this is what I like to drink. And I, I'm recognizing that this is what I like to drink. So to me, this is probably more of a country style wine, but it's not going to be the most pricey, which was interesting. That was a big aha moment. Oh, that's good. Country wine, but not the most pricey. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, this is what we're trying on all these right. episodes. This is what he's really about. Yeah. So my, I, I recognize that oh. this is going to be more of a country style wine. As opposed to trophy wine. Yeah. Trophy wines. 
You know the trophy wines that are getting ninety nine <clears throat> points. And Those are the things that are going to be higher dollars. Price tag. Yeah. You keep in a cellar 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. No, these kind of wines are more that you go on right. the countryside of the Mediterranean. These are the kind of wines that are served, right. which I think because you like Italian wines, yeah. would be right up your alley. Mm-hmm. You know what? All you guys, what you just told me, like with like you have to go seek it out. You know, which places actually, you know, have interest in the wine and whatnot, and like passion, passion, and what that tells me that wine is really, if you're really, it's it's a very communal thing, and it yeah. it, it, it can bring people together. Yeah. You know, it's not just, oh, what's the, you know, what gets the highest rating, you know, cause, yeah. okay, I'm going to buy it because I got the money, whatever, you know. But if you're actually more communal and about partaking with each other, you know, us even talking about it, I feel like that's even goes deeper to what wine actually, you know, in the enjoyment of wine. It's more about, you know, why is this good? It's in the country, but it's cheaper. Like, why? Yeah. You know, it's made by people like me and you. you exactly. Know? So, um, well, look at it yeah. this way. Wine brought us three together. Uh-huh. <laughs> Think about that yeah. for a second. Yeah. We come from very different backgrounds, very different mm-hmm. interests, very different everything. And, and look, look, look how we're just sitting there talking story about wine in a very meaningful way to me. I mean, yes. this means a lot to me, you yes, know. Yes. And so you're right. To me, it creates connections, you know. Connections. I mean, even so you guys don't understand, but for him, uh-huh. you yeah, know, he yeah. has interest, so many interests. And many of the interests are not the same as me. Him, your boy. Yeah. <laughs> but the whole point of the You're story is, <laughs> <laughs> look, yeah. look what wine has done. Uh, yeah, yeah. To the point where he created this <clears throat> podcast. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and he's searching out the stores and he's texting me saying, we're going to have two types of pork short ribs tonight. Mm. You know, and what would you recommend? And one night was, we're cooking chicken piccata. And I'm going to the wine store. Is there anything you'd recommend? Mm. You know, I mean, it, he's... He's caught the bug, just like you guys yeah. are catching the bug. And it's because, and that's what us four are sitting here, and we're sitting there going, yeah, that experience with the Portuguese rosé was, uh-huh. oh, I and mean, you know what, this rosé, I can understand how it's different. You know, I mean, it starts a, it starts a different, uh, what's the word, a different bonding thing, a bonding. different mm-hmm. conversational yeah. or connection yeah. piece, you know? And I think that's really what the essence of wine should be or is. Yeah. That's why it's in a, you know, Chris Ramel says that's why it's in a 750 mil- milliliter bottle. Instead of a twelve ounce can, okay, you know it's for Sharing. you bring it yeah. to the dinner table yeah. or to your friend's house or with your loved one, and you sh- you pour it and you share it rather than just drink your own, you know, mm. your own can. Yeah, you notice how he drinks his own can. <laughs> Shout out to Ito N. <laughs> I, I guess uh, I just wanted to Great. summarize for like the listeners. Um, I guess could you say then like you know treat um, the. Ch- I guess like the boutique wine shops almost as like a farmer's market, right? So like, yeah. I guess I've never, like, mm-hmm. as you're saying it, I'm like, oh, so I need to treat these wines as seasonal fruits, even yeah. though they are made from fruits technically and kind of building that relationship to help nurture them to kind of keep bringing that in. And well, and also it. as, I mean, you know, as that relationship with your wine buyer gets more and more deeper, you know, Melissa and Fred talk about that they were searching for Aperol on the North Shore oh. to make uh, Aperol spritz for okay. the longest time and Foodland wouldn't carry it. But as they kept asking <laughs> for it, now they started carrying it. So they're mm-hmm. affecting change in their own community in that way. So where if you're <clears throat> wanting to see something, maybe you can start asking for it, you know? Uh, got it. But, you know, Chris, you bring up an interesting, interesting point. There is a parallel between going to that kind of store and a farmer's market in the sense that these farmer's markets, hopefully when it's done well, they're championing little farmers and giving the little farmers a presence, a voice to be heard, right? A well, um, a, a, a store that does it well also are giving these small family-owned wineries a voice. Yes. Yeah. They don't have pretty labels. They don't have marketing dollars. Mm-hmm. They don't have, you know, vacations for two for the, for the person who sells the most cases of wines, you know, et cetera. These are just survival people. And yeah. is that what a sommelier yeah. does on the restaurant floor, essentially? I, I think it depends on who, each sommelier is different. Yeah. And I think sometimes you can go too extreme. I think when you bring in the term sommelier, what a sommelier is there for is what the customer wants. And if they like sweet, more commercially styled Chardonnay, so be it. Who am I to tell them, no, you should drink this rosé from Cahors instead? Mm-hmm. You know, and they're not going to like it. It's like 
they're vegetarian and you're recommending the ribeye because you think it's the best steak in, 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 in the state. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, sommelier is different. Sommelier is about uh, understanding what the customer wants mm, and then delivering accordingly. I'm just talking about what Chris said about his analogy about the farmer's market. And he's saying, you know, he gets to meet this person and they're t- you look at their hands and it's all coarse and callous from working <clears throat> in the field and they're all sunburned you know, et cetera, because they've worked and he feels that and he appreciates that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so if you, you know, cause I've been to these places and whatnot, it's the same <laughs> feeling for me. They're farmers. Yeah. Yes. No, but yeah. I, I, I can see, you shake their hands. It's coarse mm-hmm. and callous. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the same feeling same that he's feeling. talking about in terms of the farmer's market. It mm-hmm. truly is. Uh-huh. It's small mom and pop. It's not a huge thing. You know, if you go to a chateau and it's huge and they spent $27 million dollars to, mi- to build it and whatnot, yeah. how much is that affecting your cost of your bottle? You know? Yeah. And so that's the reality is that, you know, you're also s- you're supporting these, s- this is how they make their living. Right. You know, I think that's a really excellent point, Chris. That's very, yeah. very good point. And I think that I, myself too, I forget that wine makers are, they're farmers too. Absolutely. They're laborers, they're workers. Well, and that's what he there. said, like, yeah. you know, these smaller ones, these smaller farm or vineyards and stuff, they don't have the marketing dollars. Right. Right. To promote their product or yeah. the money to design a nice label or, you know, to put, to make their things eye-catching, you know, like yeah. they're, they're focused on making their product. You know, like, like somebody's, yeah, I don't want to, I shouldn't talk about large companies, yeah. but uh, <laughs> let me say this, you know, one of the things that was very clear to me about farming and it related to uh, this guy I went to, uh, I lived in a dorm with at University of Hawaii. You know, he, he owns Green Growers, which is Haulu Tomatoes on the North Shore. So I've okay. known Terry Shintaku for a long time. And Kali was getting into farming at one point, and he went to work with Richard Ha on the Big Island, who's a, who's a very famous tomato and banana farmer. I mean, he's closed shop there, and he's doing other things. But, you know, Kali went up there to work at the farm up there in Hilo, on the outside of Hilo. Uh-huh. Okay, what Terry told me is make sure you tell your son that farming is hard ass. Mm-hmm. You, when you wake up, it's black outside. When you come home, it's black outside. And it's 365 days of the year. You know, and you plan everything based upon the weather and how things are happening. Otherwise, you could lose part or all of your crop. Mm-hmm. And that's farming. And grapes are even along those lines, and even more so perhaps, because the grapes have to be under a certain condition, on a certain track towards physiological maturity, in order to make one, well, you're not just eating the grape right there. You're bottling it and fermenting it, which adds a whole nother layer of yeah. yeah. So, but also farming is lonely. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I couldn't do it anymore. Or like, I'm so interested, but you know, it, you're out there in the boonies <laughs> by yourself. Yeah. So sure. unless you find like one beautiful Big Island wahine, you're you're all alone, bro. <laughs> Shout out to Big Island yeah. wahine. <laughs> Wow, that's too funny. <laughs> okay, so we move on to the second yeah. wine. What are we drinking here? What's so this is from wine? the same area. This is Cahor, <clears throat> okay. southwest France below same Bordeaux. Area. Cahor, okay. See where it says Cahor? Okay. This is 100% Malbec. Wow, okay. So I just wanted to show you a red wine version Yeah. compared to the rosé. So you could mm. see the red wine version Visually, still has yeah. that masculinity. You yeah. see, it has kind of dark color. It's got a, a blackness to the core Definitely. as opposed to a redness or a brownness. <clears throat> and, you know, you could see, therefore, that, the, that it's c- from a very color pigmented grape. Yeah. You know, and therefore, when you taste it, it's got a little more, um, it's not fruity. It's not, it's not uh, uh, uplifting or ethereal. It's very soulful. It's very um, brooding. It's very masculine. It's very savory. Mm. Well, it's funny because it's like, I guess my first initial sip after having the rosé, for some reason, it like tasted watery. Like there was no like nothing happening, I guess, in the front (coughs) end. And then after I took the second sip, now it's like my mouth is dry, like borderline cotton mouth. And then like, I guess that's the tannins. Oh, okay. And then like and near that. Because that you to, feel that? Yeah. Like, so this thing is going to be beef and above. Got it. Ribeye? You know, it would hold up to a ribeye? No, but no. beef. You know, it could be a uh, filet mignon. It could be, you know. Top sirloin. Yeah, something, something like, like this. L- less fatty pieces of meat. Oh, okay. That's where this thing wants to play. Or uh, braised foods or long cooked foods. Still. No, uh, more. Short rib. Yeah, sh- short rib and things like that. Oh, okay. Like something that could short get ribs. drier. Not like less fatty, exactly. more like. 
But braise is long-term cooking, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Hmm. What do you think? What are your comments on this thing? Can you see a similarity of the Malbec grape between the two wines or no? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Is it weird that I can kind of taste grape skin? Like at yeah. the end, like at the finish? It is. Yeah. That's what it's from. This That's is pretty really cool. Good. It's very <laughs> consistent. Throughout. And it's very soulful to me. Yeah. It's, got, it's got something extra. Mm. And this thing in a store is probably $20 a bottle. Oh. That's incredible. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. So th- imagine <laughs> coming all the way from France. Gosh, yeah. Right? The I'm cost of the money. bottle is $1.50 to $2. The cost of the cork is 75 cents. The capsule, the label is uh, $3.50, $4.50. Uh, the capsule on top, the box, the shipping, the taxes. Oh, my gosh. Not including the labor to make the wine. Yeah, yeah. all that stuff. The taxes. $20 Ooh. a bottle. How are they making money? I know. They were like making $5 a bottle or something? Yeah, yeah exactly. That even. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. But you have to also wow. understand that unlike California wines, many of the California wines, this family has owned their vineyard for generations and generations. So there's no mortgage. Mm. You know, there's no cost of the mortgage attributed to this. And wow. they probably don't have a ton of labor. Wow. Right. Like real grassroots. Right. Amazing. Yeah. So I, I would say, I bet you this Kutal wine, I'd be surprised if he has a whole lot of labor. Oh, really? Yeah. And the other thing about this guy, he's in the middle of nowhere, you know. This guy is in the middle of nowhere. He is Farming's like, lonely. I know. He never finds <laughs> his place. He never finds his big island wahine yet. <laughs> his southern fr- or southwest France wahine. <laughs> oh, oh, trick rabbit over there, the wine opener. What is the moke version of a... F- like, is there a moke <laughs> version? And like, what? like, what would you call a moke in France? Like, is there a such thing as like a moke in France? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Is that what a country hey. girl is? Cohorse. Moke. <laughs> moke. With the okay. little. Uh, <laughs> you see, this is to me the most practical. This is the wine opener I use. That's a good one. In a restaurant. And it's not fancy. Oh, yeah? He invented it. Really? Oh. This guy has invented like the top 10 or 15 styles of wine openers out there in the middle of nowhere in the middle of i mean be like you know out out in in the country someplace you know i mean this guy shit is that's all you have to do out there that's <laughs> why Stuck it's with like when thoughts. i was living in big island harvesting tomatoes <laughs> i made my little rolly chair thing. <laughs> i didn't know he made that wow, no you did more than that i my, my cousins told me man so he invented this 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 uh, this wine. Opener. I found a couple of Big Island wahine. Okay. <laughs> Different podcast. Yeah. Here, help yourself, okay. Chris. So what's what's special about this opener, though? I want to learn. Oh, it's just the way. Uh, so this see? this is a lever. So this maximizes leverage. It, it's really fantastic. Okay. He's yeah. like an engineer kind of mind, you know, just really. And they're hard really, to get those openers. I don't see them readily available. It looks simple though, like. No, it's not fancy. But it's well constructed. It's well constructed. There's a different angle on it. Yeah. yeah. And it's thick. Yeah. The handle's yeah, thick, yeah. you know? Like, it's, it's, it's hearty feeling. It's usually small, right? Or and, and, you know, after yeah. a while, the screw part doesn't really close very well. Yeah. Or, or the top is very flimsy. Or that thing is... I, I, that's the one I use at work, and it's... It's awesome. Yeah, he invented it. His name is Philippe. Philippe, Philippe uh, I think it's... Uh, Bernabe or something. Oh. Bernabe, yeah. So That's awesome. So this is um, 100% Malbec. 100% and and would Malbec. you go to a store and would have bought this before this podcast? No, because I didn't know about it. That's right, exactly. Sure. Yep. Same I mean, for me, no way. And for, for and 20 for, bucks. And Chris, like, oh, yeah, no. for 20 bucks. Yeah. Don't you think that's a pretty good price? Oh, that's, that's a really good. Great price. Yeah. <laughs> this is more my style right yeah. here. Yeah. I guess for me, it's like, <clears throat> so, oh my God, I have like a hard time pronouncing it millennial so yeah. i'm a millennial technically and like all of my other friends too you know we are within the same age group and i guess it's like a common thing like all of us kind of find wine daunting and i think what so for me personally and kind of from my ob- observation i think what it is is because it's like with the world of um alcohol or spirits <laughs> everyone knows everything by name brands and kind of what we were talking about earlier about like, you know, all these wineries, they're all small farmers and whatever. And I think that's what keeps it daunting is just like, you know, it's, it's one thing to be like, okay, I'm going to a party. What do you guys want? Oh, tequila. What do you want? And you automatically say like, you know, the top three brands, you're like, oh, Tito's Patron. And I don't know. I can't think of a third brand right now, but 
Salsa. So it's yeah. So I mean, it's like something like that, right? It's just like how do you like, I, I, and that's the thing. It's like I know the answer is not easy, but it's like for people that are getting into it, like how do you explain it? Because you can't just tell them like, oh, gra- grab, you know, uh, what was it like, the really bougie uh, duck, not duck, duck horn. Duck horn. Yeah, so it's like, you know, it's like duck horn would be what the equivalent of, I don't know, like ace of spades or something like that, right? And it's like, okay, that's one thing. Like, I, I feel like that's how people feel with Japanese whiskeys. It's mm-hmm. just like people just want the name brand. And I think for me personally, that's what's kind of killing the spirit industry is because a <clears throat> lot of people are, sorry, I'm like kind of going a little no. off tangent, but like, you know, a lot of people are just buying to kind of, I hate to use that word, but to flex. It's just like, oh, I bought this. $30, $40 wines, and I think that's what's happening with at least my generation. It's people are buying these $30, $40, $60 wines, and they drink it. They don't know how they're supposed to drink it. Like, you know, like what we were saying earlier about these temperature changes, and like now they get turned off by it. They're like, I just put in all this money, and the wine was terrible. Yeah, but to me, what's more of a flex than like <clears throat> deep diving in research and buying a $20 bottle of wine that nobody knows about right. and showing up and being able to talk about it and explain mm-hmm. it, you know? Yeah. And I, I think with the internet now and, and you know, um, with with what Melissa said, like you, you, she drinks wine because she wants to start at 5 p.m. and make the 10 o'clock news. And I think that is becoming more and more in fashion. And relevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, and, and that's where wine plugs into mm-hmm. that. You Especially know? when you're parenting, when you get into the parenting age. But even yeah. before parenting, I'm at that stage now, you know, where either it's light beer or wine that I'm going to enjoy more. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I guess, uh, what am I trying to ask? I guess I'm trying to ask, like, for someone that's coming into here that, you know, can't contact you directly, people that are listening either for the first time, the third time, whatever, how me getting into wine, like, because that's the thing. It's like I was fortunate enough to have my aha moment with you in person, and not a lot of people are going to be able to do that. They can try, like... Everyone needs a chalk. Exactly, but it's like, okay, so let's say, you know, um, what... I guess in your opinion, what is like a good, easy aha wine for people to mm. find to kind of like, you know, because like what I was saying earlier, there's people that like put this money in. They don't know what they're looking for. They're like, ah, it's kind of expensive. It, it, right. And that's the thing. It's like it should be good, yeah. but guess, they don't realize it's the ancient wrong peaks one. is ancient. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think to answer Something your question. Available. OK, so for pink wine, the one I would recommend that's more readily available is called My Essential Rosé. And it's fifteen dollars, maybe, in a store. And at one time, it was even offered at Seven <laughs> Eleven. Sure, yeah. Th- those two wow, other ma- yeah. those two other master sommeliers did a program with Seven yeah. Eleven, and uh, one of the selections that was being offered—I don't know if it still is offered—at Seven Eleven was my essential rosé. So that's one that's readily available. So this is pink wine. It's my essential. Uh, my essential rosé. Okay. It's a simple. Easy drinking, quaffing, incredibly food friendly wine. It's called My Essential Rose. Is that drier rose? rose? Yeah, it's it's a medium dry to dry rose. Mm. Yes. And it's fifteen dollars in a store. I mean it's very reasonable. Okay. It's really good and delicious. So Okay, you oh. hey, can you grab my phone right there? So Chuck, I, I wanna talk yeah, go you go ahead, Luke, because I wanna answer Chris in a in in a in a minute here. But go ahead. So say like right, if you were to tell us a bunch of names, right? That go to this, go to that, this brand, this brand. But of course, our accessibility to certain shops are limited. Right. Like this wine, I didn't know about it. And if I walk into a shop, right, <laughs> okay, fuck you. and I will walk right past, <clears throat> walk right by it because it was only 20 bucks. I didn't mm-hmm. think anything much of it. What are things I could read on here <coughs> that, or look for? Like this thing here, Appalachian Cahors Controli. I would feel like I would, that's something I want to remember. And so I'd want to look Just for Just Cahor. But Cahor. you know what I think is more important than that, Luke? Okay. I think finding a store. Okay. Where you can because talk to the wine You can talk to somebody, yeah. you okay. know? And, and, and if I were you, you know, it's just like yeah. we came here set up. Yeah, we're talking about swam. And, 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 and yeah, exactly. And you also contacted Luke. Mm-hmm. Well, before you go to a store, you should have that guy's thing and say, I'm going to the store. Are you working today? To make sure that that guy you've connected with is working that day can help you steer into a wine. Okay. Th- that's what Instead I Instead of do. putting all the pressure on yourself to yes, find the exactly. wine. Right, right, right. Find somebody that's up with the trends. Or the other thing that's easy is just, uh, I don't know how you do it, but just reply on the podcast. Oh, like drop a comment. Yeah. To yeah. Cully 
and he'll get you an answer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know that, that that's also. I easy reply to fix. everything. <laughs> I want to make a really really bad analogy right now. <laughs> So, oh what you're saying... <laughs> oh, my God. I think you're going to this. So, what you're saying is treat your wine as your drug dealer. <laughs> oh. right? That's what Chris Melb said, too. No, yeah. it, it's true, though, right? It's like he's not going to steer the wrong way. Like, if he's the one that kind of got you into it, he's... I mean, I'm not trying to say do drugs by any means, <laughs> but, you know, that's the person you trust. That's the person you build relationships. Like, you know, wh- whether it be some, like, I guess, like, uh, an employee at one of the supermarkets that works like particularly in the wine department or whatever or going to a boutique i guess wine store <laughs> wine store is that right yeah no. yeah. yeah right yeah you guys out there on that that, that side <clears throat> of the island man you guys have a different uh, <laughs> analogy oh west side sucks yeah. <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> for me it's like where to find the right uh morung guy or <laughs> you know <laughs> Okay, this is what I want to say. I've been I've been holding off. So you were talking about drinks, and you're absolutely <clears throat> right. Okay, and this is what I want to say, is that we interviewed Dave Newman, who's Pint and Jigger. He's mm-hmm. a famous mixologist in Hawaii, and so he asked me what wine book he, that I would recommend that he mm-hmm. read. And for you guys, if you want to read a wine book just for fun. It's called okay. Adventures on the Wine Route. Adventures through a wine route. No, it's Adventures on the Wine Route. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Adventures on the Wine Route Adventures by Kermit Lynch. Wine route. And I'm not okay. sure if it's still in print, but it's just someone's diary as they go through wine country. It actually documents his aha moments. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's his first and it's experience. Just story. Yeah. It's okay, his so, first experience going to so that Old is World. So easy reading. You'll finish it in one or two days. Cool. Okay. And, and, and so he, I asked him, in, re- in, re- in reverse, what, what book would you recommend to me to right read? On. So he recommended this book, By the Smoke and the Smell. And this is to find spirits. Yes. And it says, then, I don't know which, colon, my search for the rare and sublime on the spirits trail. Okay. So I've been, my wife ordered it for me, and I've been reading it the past couple of nights. Oh, my God. It's the same mission that we're talking about here with spirits. Mm. He's up against a bigger battle than us because <clears throat> if you think about all the spirits that are out there that you that you guys have I mean, access they're powerhouses. to, they're oh, yeah. they're God, big yeah. corporations yeah. and whatnot. So he's saying that he takes trips to uh, Oxata, Oxacata, whatever you call it from Mexico, mm-hmm. O X A C A or whatever, mm-hmm. and he goes to Normandy in France to to wow. to buy beverages, uh, brandies or. Uh, tequilas or whatever from sure. the families yeah, yeah. directly yeah. that that they are farming it themselves they're mm. not you know it's not a large corporation with oil tank like refineries the craftsmen yeah so this book is all about that uh-huh. it's pretty crazy and if you think about it, it relates back to you chris talking about the farmer's market and talking about to these farmers who actually live it and do mm-hmm. it you know i mean that's pretty wild stuff man that's pretty cool so, again, that's Very what cool. these wineries are about. Awesome. Adventures on a wine route. Adventures on a wine route. Try to look it up. <laughs> on, on the wine route. Adventures on, on or throughout the wine route. <laughs> All right. We got side bets going on right now. Side bets <laughs> right now. Who is right? Adventures I on think I'm pretty sure it's adventures through a wine route. Or by or via. I mean, even for spirits, too. I, I was, like, really lucky and fortunate to actually be, like, friends with Justin Park. And he's... Who? He, just, Justin Park, GP? Oh, oh, oh bar leather apron. Bar leather apron. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just joking. Oh. <laughs> Ad- Adventures on the wine route. Oh, boom! <laughs> right in your face, brah. <laughs> Trying to correct his old man. You know yeah, what I yeah. mean? We'll correct your man, but old man. <laughs> and by the way, noise, right? my copy is uh, no, autographed. I have that wow. copy now. Oh, you stole it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you stole it, and you still don't remember the correct name of it all? But it documents. So Carmen Lynch is. One oh, of the man. largest importers. No, import. not largest. One of the, one of the top. He he he's not huge. He's just oh. very selective. One of the top importers, and <laughs> it was his aha moment. It's his first journey to France and discovering old world wine in like the seventies or whatever it was. Right so th- this rosé is a Kermit Lynch wine. Yeah, I saw that okay, in the back cool. of the label. Yeah, Kermit Lynch. K- Kermit Lynch actually has a a, a home. Out in Waimanalo. His daughter wow. and her boyfriend just came into Buzz's the, um, maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, he's wow. iconic. To introduce he, themselves, and his too. his name is on bottles. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. Like, um, um, yeah. Just because he's like the guy who gives reviews. 
No, he imports them. Oh, oh he imports them. So okay, his okay. name, his name is is big. I mean, so Imported people will just Kermit shop Lynch. for Kermit Lynch wines. Wow, it's just his name, yeah. It's yeah, because like he searches. So and that's out. also something to you know when when <laughs> I was just starting to study and didn't know where to buy wine, you told me to go on to KermitLynch.com and that you can order wines off of yeah. there. So if people cannot find good wines, that's a place to start as well. Well, on right? the mainland, you know, you have far more choices. You just got to find those stores that are progressive, like progressive, it. man. There's one, I can't remember the name of it in Orange County. Uh, for whatever reason, the name, um, man, they, their selections is so progressive, man. They, they have all the kind of wines you would want. Oh. It's pretty amazing. And they ship. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> I can't remember the name of it, though, right now. So hmm. I had uh, one question from a, a viewer from my uh, live stream. Uh, I know this is something that we've talked about off air, I think, when we second uh, recorded the second episode. But he was saying, like, th um, if you notice that wine tastes different, like you can buy the same bottle from Hawaii, but it'll taste different in Hawaii versus like on the mainland hmm. or wherever. You're asking me? Yes. Absolutely. That can be true. So the thing that you uh, <clears throat> have to understand, when you go to a, a wine cellar in France, for instance, okay. you go downstairs, right. it's dark, mm. it's cold, it's 60 something degrees down there, 60 wow. degrees. It's moldy. Moldy. Yeah, you know, it's because it's moist. Okay. So you see mold growing typically. Wow. And it's, or, or, or the more fancy wineries, it, 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 they don't. And the mold is beneficial, you know. Mm. Mm. The mold that they, that they want inside these cellars is it's, it's a type of black mold. Moss? Mold. No, but mold. what it does is it gives uh, oxygen. It oh. creates oxygen down there. Mm. So anyway, oh. that's a whole other science. There's certain molds that you don't want, so that, that's why some wineries keep it clean. And, and those fancy wineries that excel their wines for expensive, they don't want dirty. But anyway, you, what you want to mimic is... Cool, dark, damp, no motion, no light. Right? Wow. 60 yeah. degrees, typically. 55 to 60 degrees down there. So, those containers that ship wines from Europe to, to uh, all the way to Hawaii take five, six weeks to come here. Those containers get to be 110 degrees inside. If they're not temperature controlled. If they're not temperature controlled. Oh, man. So, that's, that's like sticking your bottle of wine in, in an oven... 100 degrees. Yeah. If there's a piece of fish, it'd be cooked in 15 or 20 minutes at the most. Yeah. So that's why people, when they have wines, you know, a lot of times they'll sit there going, well, this is not like how it was when I was in Italy. I mean, it changes the color of it even. Every, right? yeah. Everything. Mm. So understand that it's very possible if the wines aren't shipped in temperature control. It's mm. cooked. Which is also finding a progressive <laughs> wine shop because that could Absolutely. be happening at the wine store as well. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yes, that's a good point. Cold, dark. Yeah. What do you think about this wine, Chris? You haven't talked about this wine. I mean, I think that's kind of it. It's like, honestly, I feel like it's like uber, like really dry to me. So like right now, like I kind of feel like I've caught him out. Honestly, <laughs> it's not terrible. Like there's no like sour notes in my opinion to it. Um, it is <clears> a little <throat> lighter, I guess, in the, I guess when it like when I take my initial sips. But I, I think you, you're right, though, on, on doing these side by side on the similarities from the rosé to the red wine. Yeah, pretty fascinating stuff. Like cool. So this is the one with the braised short rib. Braised <clears throat> short rib. Red wine braised short rib. And then, sorry, so I, I guess I wanted to just little hop on that a little bit. So how you're saying about the shipment with the uh, containers. So um, with, um, I guess, like first time listeners or people that are getting into wine, what is your tip? for storing wine in Hawaii, particularly? Uh, that's a tough one, man. <laughs> He's going to shame you into buying a wine fridge. Well, it's, I mean, yeah, let's, okay, yeah. Let's, let's, do, let's do two tiers. Let's do yeah. like, if you had the budget, Easy one. this is what to do. If you don't have the budget, this is what mm. you do. So in, initially when I was young, when I was in my 20s and stuff, I just took an old refrigerator and I just, instead of making it 37 degrees, I just made it 60 something degrees. Mm. Is and it, inside it, the shelves, I just put foam, large foam things, so to minimize the vibration. vibration. That's what I did. Well, it is, 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 is it laying on the side? Is it standing yeah. up? Is it bad I, I if it's outside. stored too cold? Like if you store it in a regular refrigerator that's at 40 degrees, is that No, I, I, I don't know that. I, I don't know. Because if you look at the, some of the cellars, like in Scotland or Ireland or certain parts of England, 
those cellars are super cold, and it's almost like a suspended animation thing where the wines actually taste fresher today. Oh wow! Because they've been stored at those cool temperatures. They're so not I aging. don't know. Yeah. They're not aging as quickly, so I don't know the chemistry and all that stuff <clears throat> behind that. So I shouldn't really say, mm. but I don't. I don't. I'd rather be colder than than warmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th- that's the point. And, and so, if you do have the budget, then it's a wine fridge. Yeah, and so like for you, it would be just like leaving your AC on in here. Oh, 24 okay. hours a day or a room or a closet or something like that and just leave, leave a bowl of water or something like that down the side to make sure because air conditioning sucks out the water yes so you want to still keep the humidity at, at, at a certain rate and this is for the cork or yeah okay because what like i guess so people that don't understand the science behind the cork what ha- like what happens to the cork if there's not enough humidity yeah it dries out and it becomes it, it, it just gets brittle and it just Crack, breaks yeah. and okay yeah and that'll like affect the wine. Uh, it can opening the wine. Oh. Yeah. So I've heard like with like super old vintage wines that like you have to like throw out like a quarter or a third of it because of corking or something. Is that true? Or is it's that not like corking? It's sediment. Oh. So but what is that? If you could explain. Uh, so. Okay. So there's many things that, as the wine it changes, uh, as the wine ages, it changes, and there's all these mini chemical reactions and type of reactions that happen inside the bottle. And some of it is based upon its interaction with slow oxygen. And so it connects with what you see as tannins. Mm -hmm. You know that pucker power that you get, the dryness, that cotton mouth? Yes. That's created by tannins. So sometimes when uh, it's, it's also considered an antioxidant. So over time, some people believe that the oxygen connects with that and it drops out after a while as like little pieces of dirt or sand inside the bottom of the bottle because it's heavier than the liquid. So that's why when you open old bottles, mm-hmm. you're going to see this much it could be sediment. Oh, wow. So what you do as a sommelier is you hold a bottle gingerly and you decant by looking through here. You decant the wine so you can see the clear liquid going out. And when you see the sediments start coming up, that's when you stop. Okay, and for the for the people that aren't w- watching the YouTube, when he said here, he's pointing at the neck of the bottle. Mm. Yeah, there you go. See these guys, they know, huh? Yeah. Behind the scenes, <laughs> they know, bro. You he know. knows, bro. So, so what you're saying is, throw out all my wines that I bought from Swam because it's been sitting in a cabinet. <laughs> Bro, that's vinegar, I Andy. Know. Fuck. <laughs> no, no, Especially no. in my pool, bro. That's vinegar, hey, Chris. Cause. Chris, Shake what I suggest Shake is that you just pound down a few uh, <laughs> the kind. When, and when you don't carry more, then you get okay. the wine. There you go. God damn it. It was like 2012. I was like, yeah, I'm going to save this for later. Cook with nope. Me. Played myself. It might be good. You never know. You know, you never know. You never know. <laughs> Where you got next to the bugong? <laughs> 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 Any last questions before we wrap it up? I, I, think Look, see? I don't know. I just, I guess, thank you for yeah. um, no, thank having you. us. I mean, this is very awesome, and we're usually behind the camera, and so it's pretty cool to to be a part of this and to actually, um, I don't know, be listened to. It was pretty cool. You know, for thank me, you. guys, I connected with you on that very first day. It was the first awesome. day I met you guys, <laughs> and we connected. <laughs> we were pouring wines, talking story, yeah. and and Kelly envisioned us having a formal thing here. And here I am talking to the guys behind, yeah. you know, and just asking, "What do you think, Luke? Hey, Chris, <laughs> what do you think?" We immediately connected, right you know, nice. and it was it's pretty special. And even today, it made it even more like uh, really cool to hang well, out. Well, and, and that's what like he this. feeds off of too. You I know? dig it, man. Yeah, I nice. dig the fact, and you know, you can ask me whatever. It, it, it I don't. I don't sit there going, freaking Chris, you, 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 <laughs> freaking Luke, what? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not that at all. I mean, yeah. the very fact that I was telling Cully that you, you know, Chris, he, his eyes just popped up when he had that uh, uh, rosé. So yeah. did yours. Oh, man. And okay. I, I totally get off on that mm. kind of excitement when someone yes. experiences something and has an aha moment. Mm-hmm. That totally rings my bell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So thank awesome. you, gentlemen. I yeah, appreciate thank greatly. And thanks Great. for all your help and helping us put this thing together. For sure. You know, technically and all that stuff and, and giving your time and, and hanging out. So uh, much mahalo to you guys. Cully, thank you. Another thank you great episode here. Yeah. To all of you, uh, thank you for <clears throat> viewing this one and checking us out and listening to us talk story like four good old friends. We <laughs> hope you tune in next week. Until then, aloha, everybody. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you.